Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome, and thank you for coming here in the pouring rain. Um, I also want to welcome the people who are joining via webcast, um, and you can tweet your questions or email them to us. Um, we'll have uh, each of the three speakers um, give presentations and brief remarks, and then we'll have uh, plenty of time for question and answer. Um, so I also want to thank OPEX Brazil, who partnered with us and helped us with organize this event today. Um, and I want to thank Chevron, who sponsored the um, event and, and the breakfast. Thank you. Um, so just for background, um, Brazil, as you know, has huge oil and gas reserves. Um, the early estimates when the pre-salt was discovered about 10 years ago um, were around 50 billion barrels of oil equivalent, which if proven would put Brazil on par um, with countries like Libya and Nigeria and in the top 10 oil producers. Oil production has been rising in recent years, but the growth has been much slower than the original projections uh, showed. Um, and state company Petrobras, which produces around 80% of the country's oil, repeatedly missed its production targets because it was unable to manage a large number of complex oil projects. Um, and then more recently, the, comp the company also um, has been plagued by the corruption scandal and unsustainable debt obligations. So in this context, President Temer, who took office last year after the impeachment of his predecessor, has taken a more market-oriented approach. Um, the president appointed a new CEO to Petrobras, who is charged with reducing the company's debt, and the company is, the government is now looking to attract more private investment alongside Petrobras in order to develop the reserves. Last November, Temer signed a law to remove a requirement that Petrobras operate all uh, pre-salt um, projects, and the law required it to have a 30% stake. Now it has uh, the right to uh, refuse that and, and have other companies operate, which is very significant. Um, the government also announced it would cut local content requirements, which had been um, unsustainable and, and which the industry wasn't able to meet. Um, and so that makes operating costs lower and it makes it easier to hire international contractors. So over the next three years, uh, Brazil plans to auction 287 exploration blocks in 10 separate bidding rounds, um, which it hopes will lift um, daily production by 2 million barrels over 10 years. Three of those tenders are scheduled for this year, um, in which the, the country expects $1.4 billion in investment. However, there is still a great deal of uncertainty um, regarding the longer term outlook for the oil and gas sector. Um, Temer, President Temer only has about a year and a half left in office. Um, it's really unclear what will happen after that with the elections. Um, so there's still a, a lot of um, long-term uncertainty. And I think the global oil context is also very challenging. Um, you know, oil prices have been hovering around 50 to $55 a barrel, uh, as opposed to the $100 barrel range when the pre-salt was first discovered. Um, so these are the issues that um, the speakers will address today. Um, we have an excellent group, and um, they'll be discussing the current scenario, the government's plans, the industry's perspective, um, and how all this will work in terms of bringing new investment to the country. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce our speakers. Um, so to my left is uh, Desio Doni. He's the general director of the Brazilian National Agency for Petroleum, Natural Gas, and Biofuels, the ANP, um, so the Oil Regulatory Agency. Previously, he worked as a statutory officer and chief investments officer at Braskem um, and as oil projects officer at Grumo Logistica. And he's also worked at Petrobras for many years in different managerial positions in Brazil, Argentina, Angola, Libya, and Bolivia, Libya and Bolivia, um, including as CEO and chairman of Petrobras Energia and Petrobras Brazil, uh, Bolivia. Um, Jorge Camargo is the president of the Brazilian Institute for Petroleum, Gas, and Biofuels, the IBP, um, which is the uh, oil industry association, so he represents the, the perspective of the industry. Um, previously, he worked at Petrobras for 27 years, including as a member of its executive board, and after that, he was president of Stad Oil Brazil. Jed Bailey is, a, is the managing partner of Energy Narrative, um, which is a consulting firm based in Boston. Previously, he worked as Vice President for Applied Research Consulting and Managing Director for Emerging Markets at IHS CIRA, 
uh, where he was responsible for the company's research and operations in Latin America and Asia. And I've asked him to, to kind of give some um, of the, the more regional and global context to the remarks. Um, so I think um, Desio has asked that Georgie speak first so that he can see what he says before he has to <laughs> respond. So I will <laughs> um, go with his wishes. Um, so you have a, a PowerPoint presentation. Here's the little clicker. You have the slides. Lisa, thank you very much for this introduction. Thank you for the dialogue, for inviting me to be here. It is a pleasure, it's an honor not to be in such a, such a well-respected think tank in, in Washington. So it's a, well, uh, let me start, okay. So I, IBP, IBP, that's this organization that I have the honor to preside, is completing 60 years this year, and lively than ever, you know? During these periods of change, uh, transformation, transition, that, that's when the organization like IBP, and understand also the dialogue, we have lots of change, that's when we become more, more active, né? more relevant. And that's what is happening in Brazil, a lot of change and transformation. As you know, and, and this, this uh, the, time, the, the economist covers now are really excellent. Uh, and uh, if you look at the they they really they really describe very well what uh, the boom and bust that Brazil has experienced over the last uh, the last uh, years. Né? And um, but the good news the good news is that Brazil is, is emerging né? from the the worst political, economic, and ethical crisis of its history. Né? And this and this emerging it's transforming itself as it emerged from this crisis. A crisis is very good to transform us. Né? Companies. People and, uh, and and countries, uh, and uh, and Brazil that's emerging from this crisis is a Brazil that is cleaner, that has its uh, institutions strengthened, and not only Brazil, the the oil and gas sector is also experiencing an uh, an important transformation. We are basically moving from one model uh, that has prevailed over the last years, that was a model of. Uh, of a strong state protagonism, strong state intervention on the energy sector. This model has exhausted itself, more or less, when the commodities collapsed in 2014. And as a result, we are moving to another model, which is more open, more diversified, more competitive, and uh, friendlier to, to, to private investment. Well, it's, it's not only the Brazil, that is in transition. The whole energy sector, global energy sector, is really moving to another. Uh, some people call it to another era, really. Né? We have uh, all these uh, these effects of uh, the climate policies in COP 21. We have the emergency of the of the renewables, gaining scale, gaining economicity. We have basically we have the the, the shale oil revolution, the U.S. And as a result, we have this abundance of re of energy today. Né? and somehow a weakening of the demand of fossil fuels. Now, people don't talk anymore about peak oil, they are talking about peak demand and expecting this peak demand for 2030, 2035. Né? And as a result of this uh, abundance of supplies and the weakening of demand, of course, we have this scenario that uh, people understand that scenario is going to prevail for a long time of low oil prices. Né? And, uh, and we have, of course, lots of volatilities. Né? The, the, the interesting thing that this, uh, this volatility, these unpredictably, uh, uh, unpredictions are not only coming from a less stable parts of the globe, but also now from Europe and from North America. Né? But ba basically, the, the result is that we have uh, the, the oil and gas or, or time horizon has shortened it. Né? So a strategy like uh, delaying production to gain to gain uh, market share doesn't make much, much sense nowadays. So we are really entering into a new era. Some people call this transition, some people call this a revolution. And that was going on on, this, uh, on the global scene. So how, how Brazil fits on this new competitive environment? Huh? This, is a, this is a study that, uh, that uh, Wood Mackenzie has done. I think it's uh, interesting, it, it compares the different uh, oil provinces in the world, in the planet, 
é, com, é, compared to the, the break-even price, which is the price that is able to, to remunerate the, the investments and pay the, pay the taxes and the operation costs. And then he, he and also the, 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 the potential production growth that this province can, uh, can uh, deliver on the next 10 years. And as you can see, uh, 10, uh, three, three provinces stand out in this, in this graph as the most, let's say, competitive in terms of economic return in this low oil price scenario, né? which is Middle East, no surprise on that, on short Middle East. It is uh, the, the shale oil, the, the American shale oil, and the Brazilian offshore. Right? So these are the three most relevant, the most economically robust, robust uh, uh, provinces in the world nowadays. And offshore, no doubt that Brazil is the place that produces the more materiality and the more economic uh, robustness. Right? So, uh, of course, the, 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 the width of these uh, of this, uh, bars right? reflects the capacity of, of production growth. In this, of course, is not, and you see that the United States shale it stands at the most uh, growing the expectation. And this has not to do, of course, with the, how much the reserves or the break-even. It's about really about the above-ground risks. Right? And the United States is really the country which is more dynamic, more open. Huh? Middle East now is very sh short. It shows that it's basically closed yet. And Brazil is still well below its potential. But this is about also, as I said, about the above ground risks, but not uh, on the, the competitive uh, sea. Well, why Brazil, né, uh, offshore Brazil, the pre-south mainly, stands out as so competitive in this, uh, because pre-south, as you may know, is on the edges of the, the, the technological, the offshore technology. Né? It's a kilometer, hundreds of kilometers away from shore, 3,000 meters of water depth, 6,000 meters of depth, 2,000 meters of salt that we have to delay. How come that this province can be economic at uh, oil price in the range of 40 to 60 barrels a day? So, the, the, and the answer is that the amazing productivity that the pre-salt reservoirs delivers uh, is something unheard of offshore. So we, we have uh, wells in the pre-salt that produce something like 20, 30 barrels per day, some more than 40. So the average, the pre-salt is not a promise anymore. It's producing more than 1 million barrels a day nowadays. And the average production per well is around 20,000 barrels a day. So it's really high. And that's productivity. That's what explains this uh, extraordinary economicity that the pre-salt uh, delivers. Well. Uh, we, we, this is a restart projection of uh, the production growth in Brazil over the next, the next 15 years. And this, as you can see, is basically based on discovered resource, based on what we have or we already know. And as you can see, based on that, uh, on that graph, Brazil is going to double its production in the next, uh, in the next 15 years. So Brazil is, will be one of, one of the countries of the fastest growth in terms of production over the years. This, this graph, this study studies, of course, base itself that Brazil will be able to remove the obstacles to, the, to, 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 to investments that we have been, unfortunately, building over the years. Now, if we are able to remove these obstacles, Brazil has the potential to double its production and perhaps go even more, now, because as I the result, we are just uh, starting the exploration of uh, its, uh, its potential. But that's what we have, uh, we can achieve. So what are the obstacles that we have? And from that, on that side, I also have good news to report to you. This we call the, the ENP agenda of the oil and gas industry. We have uh, this agenda for years. It was the same agenda year after year. The good news now that this agenda is, is being addressed by the government. We have uh, here, I think I have, I have to make, uh, to make a, a rest or, or acknowledgement that the government we have today, they, they have uh, embraced this agenda and they are delivering on that. And, and in, some, in some areas, very important uh, change. For example, the, 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 the removal of the Petrobras being the, the only, the sole operator in the result. Né? This was a big political debate and, uh, and the government showed a lot of uh, political capacity and political courage, I would say. To, to get this passed. Also, the, the local content rules that really was a, a, a policy that didn't work, 
was a policy based on, 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 on protection, a policy that was really an obstacle to investments. This policy has been flexibilized, transformed into something much more, much more rational. The calendars of bid round, I'm sure my friend Desu will elaborate. This is a very important uh, decision that we have. Uh, we are going to have four rounds this year. And, and more than that, we, we, can ex we can see how the, the rounds we are going to have in 2018 and 2019. So this is completely new and very much welcome for, by the industry. Gas development, we are just starting with the, the Petrobras divestments. Petrobras is usually basically the monopoly on gas markets in Brazil. They are selling their assets and as a result opening a new era in, the, in this market in Brazil. So these are very important progress that we are having. But having said that, I, I don't want to convey to you that Brazil has sorted out this problem. It's not true. We still have a long way to go. We have, we have lots of areas that need to be improved. To be improved. And I would mention just two, to environmental licensing. This is really an issue in Brazil. Things take uh, three, four years to get a license. Uh, you take, let's say, the, the, the 11th round. That was in 2000 and, and, uh, and um, I think 2013, you know? So they are going to complete four years now, and we don't have the license yet. There are 37 wells that have been uh, uh, committed. No wells have been drilled because we have no license. NEP, the, the agency that uh, DSU heads, is very flexible. They're extending, let's say, the exploration period of this license, but that's not what we want. We want to drill, we want to invest, and Brazil needs that. So we have a problem with environmental license. We have some uncertainty and some problems also on the fiscal and regulatory issues. I can mention Repetro, which is a special system in Brazil that removes tax from investment. So this is, uh, without that, there is no way Brazil can compete in the, in the global scenario. So this has been promised by the government. We are in OTC last week. We have been together there. The, 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 the government said it's a matter of days. Né? But this is very important that we have this sorted out. If not, we are going to have this uh, contamination, the good news, and the next rounds that we are going to have uh, during these years. So, but, we, the, but the bottom line is that we are progressing very importantly, and we have to acknowledge that the, the government understands. And the problems that we still have, they are aware, and they are trying to address. They have not solved because not easy to be solved. If they were easy to be solved, they have already been solved. But we are moving forward in, the, in a very, very important way. It's not only in the ENP on the, that, uh, that, that are being changed in Brazil. There is a lot going on there. Né? We have this gas, for example, that I mentioned. The downstream is an area that's going to be opened also by mainly the, the fact that Petrobras has a, has a, a, a divestment and a partnership program. That's a really open monopolies. Monopolies on the, on the gas, as I said. Monopolies on the midstream and the logistics. Monopolies on the refinery. So this is going to open a really new era, a new year in Brazil. That's probably, or certainly, the most important uh, transformation period that Brazil is living on this oil and gas sector since its inception even more than in the 90s when they opened, Brazil opened the upstream sector. So it's, uh, it's BNDES financing the, the, the renewables. So there's a lot of initiatives going on at the moment, and Brazil is really, really moving at a vast, very fast and intense place in all these areas. Well, uh, what we have to really watch uh, going forward uh, on the next one or two years, now. Nah? These rounds that we are going to have this year, we're going to have four. Uh, the result of this, of this round is we cannot predict, but they are going to, exp to, exp to, uh, to show how much competitive Brazil has become in, in the attraction of global investment. This will be, let's say, the proof of the pudding, how far we have been. We, I, I am optimistic, but uh, you know, we have to, to see how, how this uh, performs. The Petrobras divestment plan, this is very important for it because that in, impacts not only the, the Petrobras uh, shares and the, the Petrobras financial recovery, which has been impressive. Petrobras under the Petro Parente leadership is really is saving the company. Some many analysts in the past pre presumed that Petrobras was almost beyond salvation huh, without a massive injection of capital. Pedro Parente and his team is, is proving them wrong and uh, recovering the Petrobras finance. But the divestment, is, the, the, the Petrobras divestment plan is fundamental for this strategic plan. It's fundamental for this re economic recovery of, of, of Petrobras and very important for this new phase that Brazil is uh, experiencing in the opening of the sectors. 
And of course, we have election next year. Né? And this election is a big question mark. Where, which way is going to Brazil? Né? It could be more liberal or more closed. And, and that's really an effect that affects, for example, uh, service companies that are very much looking what's going to happen because they have to make decisions that are more short term. Oil and gas people, they have a longer term of view. Now, when you went in a project, we have projects for 20, 30, 50 years. So you are going to have many elections on the, on, on the way. But it's still elections next year is a key factor affecting the mood and the way that the, the investors are going to behave. So these are the main events of the, to watch. Yeah? And to close, I brought this uh, definition from this uh, Italian uh, philosopher, Antonio Gangshi. He uh, says that crisis is a time when old has not yet gone and new has not yet arrived. I think that I like this, 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 this definition of crisis, and, and in many aspects, it defines very well uh, how Brazil is, defines Brazil nowadays. We are really doing this transition, this, this, this crossing né, from one to another stage, and that's, uh, and that's what I want to say today. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. That's a great um, overview of the concerns of the industry, what, what has happened and what remains to be done. So um, I guess you, we will get your PowerPoint if you were to put us on. So while they, while they prepare the PowerPoint, uh, I would like to thank you, the organizers, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to be here. And, again with my friends Jeb and George. I know them for, for quite a while. I won't say how long. <laughs> it's not wise. And I, I'm glad that I'm talking just after George. I knew that. Because he made a presentation in which we had a broader view of the scenario in, in Brazil. So I can focus in what I know best, which is the Okay, in this transformation that we are going through at, uh, at this moment. George has already mentioned, but when Petrobras was founded in the, in the 50s, most of the Brazilian population lived in the rural areas. The economy was based in agriculture. And then during this almost 70 years in which our society has modernized and the economy has, has developed, we always had Petrobras as the dominant player, the monopolist player. At the effect. And for most of this time, me and George, we were there. Yeah. And now uh, things are changing. We had two moments of opening during this long period of uh, monopoly. In the 70s, we had uh, some risk contracts under the military rule for exploration. The result was poor. Just one gas field was discovered in the, in the Santos Basin. And then we had the large transformation that the industry faced in the end of the 1997, when the Pet Petrobras monopoly was formally extinguished and the agency was uh, created, we had the first bid rounds. We attracted more than 100 exploration companies to, to participate in our EMP sector. And this, this move was so successful that we discovered as a result of this bid rounds, the pre-south one of the largest oil provinces yet to be explored fully in, in the world. But this success brought discussions, political discussions on contract terms, on the regulation. And these discussions brought us some paralysis in our, in our system. And we stayed a few years without bid rounds. And now we are facing this, this lack of new opportunities, and we are in the moment with very few exploratory wells being drilled in Brazil, with very few discoveries to be, to be developed, and, and that's impacting the, 
de speed in which the, the industry operates in Brazil and also is, is affecting the, the economy as, as, as a whole. When you move into the other main segments of the oil and gas industry, the natural gas business and the downstream sector, we see that Petrobras has been dominant in these segments since the 50s. No relevant presence of any, any private company in, in these two sectors. And now, this is starting to change. As a result of the new improvements in the energy policy, as a result of Petrobras divestment plan, we are starting the largest transformation that we have ever faced in the oil and gas industry in, in Brazil since the foundation of Petrobras, I would say since ever. We are having the bid rounds. It's a major transformation for the oil and gas industry because for the first time we are welcoming international operators to, to act in the pre-South region, not only Petrobras to be the, the only operator. And I think, I believe, we, we all believe that it will bring a different dynamics to the, to the sector, benefiting the, 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 the oil production and the economy. But we also are, with, we, we are also facing the transformation in the natural gas business and in the downstream business. Petrobras divestment plan includes natural gas infrastructure uh, act assets and logistics, and they are saying now logistics and refining assets. So I'm sure that after, as a result of all this uh, divestment we will have in Brazil, much more competitive, much more dynamic market that will benefit not only the companies, but especially the consumers and, and, and the society. And that's the work of the agency to, to be there to, to make sure that this, this, this happens. We also have a, a, another Another impact of this, all this situation that we, we, we live in Brazil, especially because of the Petrobras crisis and the corruption investigations that affected deeply the main service companies in Brazil, is that this new market in which Petrobras will continue to be a relevant player, but not the dominant player, with several other companies competing with them in the different segments of the industry, we will see the need for a new renovated service sector and a new and renovated supply chain sector. So there are a lot of opportunities for companies in, in our industry in Brazil to be opened in the next, in the next uh, few years. So after being quick in this, in this introduction, I would like to tell you what we are we are doing in terms of uh, improvements in the energy policy. We have, George mentioned here, last year the government has approved a bill that allows other operators to operate in pre south Very recently, a week ago, the, the minister has published a new, ministry has published a new, a new document resuming the EMP policies that uh, we will apply in Brazil for public uh, hearing. We have several government programs dedicated to the main aspects of the, our industry. One uh, program to reactivate uh, exp exploration and production onshore. That is a program to develop the natural gas market, uh, one for biofuels, and one to develop the supply of uh, oil derivatives and biofuels in, in, in Brazil. And very recently, we have announced the new schedule and calendar of bid rounds and new local content uh, policies. Having said that, I think it's time to concentrate in the, in, in the agency and what we are doing in order to, to fulfill our role in this new momentum. And we have adapted in our strategy 
we are now focusing in the EMP sector in encouraging and encouraging and oil and gas exploration and production to carry out the bidding rounds to stimulate late life of the existing fields and maximize our recovery in our reservoirs. We are doing a very big effort in trying to improve the contracts, to simplify the re regulations, to speed up process, to attract investors. We are deeply engaged in develop a gas market that meets the society's interest and to promote investments in the downstream uh, sector as well to guarantee supply of fuels to the Brazilian society. Coming to the EMP sector and the bid rounds, as I mentioned, for the first time ever, we have approved a calendar of bid rounds. In this uh, policy that is open for public hearing, the idea is to have a five-year calendar, but we are starting with a, a three-year calendar. So in this three first years, 2017, 2018, and 2019, we have now announced 10 bid rounds. We have four 2000, in 2017, three in 2018, and three in 2019. We have four this year because we have two bid rounds for the pre-South uh, region. One includes some blocks for unitization that were considered in the past. We start this, this program next week with a fourth bid round for small and marginal fields on, you know, in the onshore region. Then you continue in October 27, oh, September 27, with the 14 bid round for con the concession model. And then on October 27, the second and third pre south bid round. Then we have one pre south bid round, one marginal field bid round, and one concession bid rounds in 2018 and, to and 2019. Just to give you an idea what we have in offer in 2017, this map shows the concession uh, concessions to be offered, 287 blocks in different regions of Brazil, onshore and offshore. Our technicians estimate that we have unrisked in-place volumes around 15, 50 billion barrels in, in all these blocks. In the second production sharing bid round, the one for the pre-south, pre we are offering four areas. Carcará, Gato do Mato, Tartaruga, Verde, and Sapinhoá. Sapinhoá is already uh, uh, producing 250,000 barrels a day. And we estimate that in the largest of these uh, areas, Carcará, the area to be put to offer is, holds about 2.2 billion barrels of uh, reserves. And then uh, the third pre sale bid round to be happening in October 27 as well. We are offering four exploration areas, two prospects, Peroba and Pau Brasil. Peroba holds according to our geologists. We don't like to give uh, guidance to the industry. They, they, don't do, they don't need that. But since we have already disclosed some information on the volumes contained in each one of these prospects, uh, I'm giving you some more uh, consistent numbers now. So it's 5.3 billion barrels in Peroba and 4.1 billion barrels in Pau Brasil. The other two areas, they are exploration areas between Campos and Santos Basin. We don't have any accurate number, estimate on uh, volumes, but we can say that's uh, very large areas that can contain volumes equivalent to some of the largest oil fields of offshore Brazil. Then in 2018, we'll have the 15 concession bid round, and in 19, the 16 one. The, the map is there with all the areas we are offering, so the companies had time to anticipate their studies. In case anyone is interested in more detail, we are available the agencies to, to discuss. We have the maps. You can visit our website, Brazil Rounds, and you can get additional information on this on these areas. 
and then next next year the uh, the fourth production sharing bid we are offering three prospects Arturno, Tres Marias and Urapuru though some companies treated them with, with different names it doesn't matter their coordinates are the same but and for for exploratory blocks jump one and then we have in 2000 19, the fifth production sharing build round with three areas, Aran, southeast of Lula, south and southwest of Jupiter, and Boomerang. What we are doing in terms of uh, contracts, we are now working on the contracts for the 14th concession build round. We are changing the way we treat the exploratory phase. Instead of splitting two, we will have just one exploratory phase without the obligation of drilling a second well, uh, well in the second one. We are adjusting the royalties for marginal onshore areas and frontier exploration, exploratory blocks. We are trying to do simplifications in the contracts, uh, reducing the entry costs, and stimulating the participation of uh, investment partners with qualified operators and several other measures that you can see when we put the tender protocol in the contract for, for public consultation. What we expect as a result of all this, this 10 bid rounds that we have already announced and then it will have an important impact in the oil and gas industry in, in, in Brazil. Currently, we, we have around 13 billion barrels of uh, reserves. We produce 2.5 million barrels of oil and 100 million cubic meters of gas per day. And as a result of this uh, 10 bid rounds, statistically, we, est we estimate that we will attract more than $80 billion in direct investment. We can I'll add that to that the uh, indirect investment, uh, which are not considered, to discover 10 billion barrels of uh, recoverable reserves. And we'll need more than 300 offshore wells to produce those reserves using up to more than 20 drilling rigs working simultaneously. We will need 17 new floating production storage uh, units, more than 1,000 kilometers of uh, flow lines, we see two new pipelines being built from the Campos and Santos Basin to bring natural gas to shore. And this, all this investment will add around 20, 2 million barrels of production in 2027. It's a very relevant impact in, in the country economy. That was it. I would like to finish repeating what I have said here, but concentrating in the, in the message that these 10 bid rounds are offering acreage containing billions of barrels of oil in place, creating opportunities for all, every type of uh, exploration and production company. Some of those blocks that are in offer are among the most attractive exploratory opportunities available in the whole planet. And we are sure that companies interested in investing in, in Brazil, not only in the oil and gas sector, but uh, as I mentioned, in downstream, in the natural gas, in the service business, they have in front of them the largest wind of opportunity in decades. So I hope to see some of you in September and October 27. And thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you. Um, that's a very ambitious calendar and it's interesting to see that you know some 10 years ago um, similar there were similar goals you know doubling production discovering a lot of new reserves and for a long time nothing happened toward making that happen and, and it's a, a huge change to see this um, very ambitious calendar and, um, and production projections um, so Jed can you give us sure. your remarks you know it's a, a pleasure to be here and to have a chance to join this excellent panel. Uh, as Lisa mentioned at the start, uh, I thought I would provide a little bit of regional context. 
and talk broadly about three trends that we see uh, affecting the industry in general and the Western Hemisphere in particular, and try and tie those into uh, what it may mean for Brazil and, and some of the, the programs and ambitions that were uh, elucidated earlier. So broadly speaking, I want to talk about the political regulatory flux that we see across the entire region, talk a bit about the impact of shale development and how that's changing the oil industry in general, uh, and then a little bit, if we have time at the end, about the combined impact of shale gas development and the surge in renewable energy and what that means for natural gas markets and their potential impact on, on upstream uh, exploration as well. So broadly speaking, you know, when we look across Latin America and, and indeed the entire Western Hemisphere, it, it appears that pretty much every single major oil producer has either gone through or is about to go through or is going through some type of very significant political or regulatory change uh, across the entire region. So we have many changes that are, are likely to be beneficial for the oil industry, uh, some of the regulatory changes here in the United States, the opening of Mexico's upstream oil sector over the last few years, uh, the recent changes announced in Brazil, certainly in Argentina as well, um, but all very recent and in a context of, of uh, should we say, significant political turmoil uh, in many of those countries. Uh, other countries uh, making changes that are perhaps uh, less beneficial for the upstream oil industry, uh, things like tightening of the CO2 regulations in Canada, uh, the ongoing chaos in Venezuela, a uh, new election in, in Ecuador with uncertain prospects for what that may mean for the oil industry. So the broad common denominator there is change uh, and uncertainty about how long lasting these changes will be. Right? We have elections coming up again in Brazil relatively soon. Um, Macri is, is deeply unpopular in Argentina, although he's making some very necessary changes, whether he can see those through or if they're continued is uncertain. Uh, we may see uh, a significant change in policy in the US within four years or within eight, hard to say. Um, also, uh, potential uh, pressures in Mexico as well with an election coming up there in 2018. So this sort of broad uh, atmosphere of change and uncertainty has the impact of slowing down investments, slowing decision making in particular, uh, and causing you know, the folks that are writing the big checks to think twice uh, about exactly where they want to put that money uh, and, and what they want to see before they can commit to that. So one sort of caveat for the entire region to, to pay attention to. Uh, quickly to talk about the, the shale impact, uh, as was mentioned earlier, and, uh, and, and uh, Georgie's uh, slide there showing the, the cost uh, curves and the, the potential new supply. As he noted, shale is a huge part of that potential growth, uh, and that's having an impact on the industry writ broadly, not only because it's becoming the source for the majority of new supply and potentially now acting as the swing producer uh, more and more, but also because the business of producing oil from shale is so fundamentally different from the business of producing oil uh, from the more traditional wells, and, and in particular, deep water. So by that, I mean, and for those of you who know this, this is a very, um, very quick overview. A shale well uh, is very cheap, very quick uh, to, to drill. Uh, you do a, a very quick vertical, turn it horizontal, and follow the shale seam as far as you can, frack it to get a sudden surge of oil and gas production. Uh, which gives you an, an immediate uh, production uh, the moment you frack. So unlike a, a more traditional well where it takes many years to develop design uh, before you see actual oil production, you get an immediate gratification from a shale well. As Jorge noted, a very small gratification because each well doesn't produce a whole lot, but it is immediate, and then it goes away very fast. It declines you know, upwards of 40, 50, 60 percent in the first year. So it's, it's not a question of finding the oil, planning things well to then spend a ton of money up front to produce large volumes over the next 30 years. It's very quick, nimble, very small, chunky investments that can be done all over very fast that give you a surge of cash quickly and then go away uh, with very little uh, exploratory risk. That difference, uh, which is continuing to change as the, te as the technology evolves, the processes evolve, uh, the costs are continuing to change, is creating uh, a certain tension, I would say, within the industry uh, because it responds very differently to price signals and investment signals. And I would say over the, the last three or four years, uh, say since the, uh, the OPEC uh, pullback on production, uh, sorry, I said the OPEC uh, declined to pull back in production back in 2014, it's been a, a contest between uh, OPEC's willingness to give up market share versus Wall Street other investors' willingness to continue pouring money into shale 
on the assumption that uh, it can continue to, to make a profit. So that tension is there. Uh, it affects the, the projects that are the largest cost and the lo longest lead time, which includes deep water. Uh, Brazil has the benefit of having extremely productive wells, as was noted, uh, which certainly helps. It also affects other you know, capital-intensive projects like uh, the Canadian oil sands, for example. And we've certainly seen a, a wide-scale disinvestment from those over the past year, in part because of this dynamic and in part because of the changing CO2 regulations there. I would also note it's changing the industry in other ways that are, are less noticeable. So for example, because the surge in production is so fast, there's limited need to hedge that or, or worry about prices in the longer term. And so what you see on the forward strip is the volume of contracts that are longer than, say, two or three years has collapsed over the last, say, three or four years. So since shale production has become the majority of new US production, there's a, a surge in, in forward contracts that are hedging those prices for a year out, maybe two years out. But the shale producers don't really care three or four or five because the, the production's gone at that point, the large volumes of it. So when you look at a 10-year at a strip, the volume of contracts supporting that, that price 10 years out is a fraction of what it was three or four or five years ago, uh, less than a quarter of what it was in the past, which means it's less indicative of a market view, um, and it's likely to be a much more volatile uh, price as, as it responds more dramatically to small changes with the small number of people that are buying that contract. So it's a it's a change that's that's less noticed i think than the actual current prices today but one that i think will have a longer term dramatic impact on how the industry is is conducted uh, say 5 to 10 years from now and then the last point although i'm two more minutes two more minutes yeah all right uh, the last point on on natural gas uh, just to to build on the comments earlier the world is awash in gas um, the, the amount of volume coming out of the US, uh, much of that associated with shale oil production, which means it has a negative price, right? You've got to produce it and, and get rid of it somehow in order to get the money from the oil. Our view is there's several hundred TCF worth of reserves, trillion cubic feet worth of, res worth of reserves that have a, a negative price to produce. Uh, and perhaps you know, upwards of 1 point, well, sorry, 1,300 to 1,400 trillion cubic feet in the US that can be produced at less than $4 a million BTU. So huge amounts of gas potentially available, and that's just the US, never mind Australia, Mozambique, many of these other countries that are likely to produce. Many of them now looking to export. You know, the US swinging from a huge importer to an exporter completely changed the global LNG markets. Uh, and the challenge then is if you're a, a country that is wanting to produce oil and you find gas with it, you have to decide what to do with that gas. I think Brazil has the enviable position that it has a large enough domestic economy, it can absorb large amounts of that gas itself. Uh, if you're looking to try and export uh, excess volumes, good luck, because there's a, a huge number of competitors that are already out there, uh, already exporting. And especially if it's, say, offshore gas that then costs money to bring onshore, that then costs more money to try and export, that puts you at a, at a very uh, competitive disadvantage to others. That's further complicated, as I mentioned, by renewable energy, uh, with the surge in renewable energy uh, investment, and particularly the cost of solar power coming down so dramatically over the last few years. Uh, we've seen uh, auctions in Mexico and Chile where the preferred, or sorry, the, the, the offered price for solar-provided power was less than 40, even down towards $30 per megawatt hour. That's cheaper than you can produce with a very efficient combined cycle using gas, even at today's gas prices in the United States. So from that perspective, solar is now among the cheapest options available, as long as it's only a certain share of the total. Once you get too high, you get to come uh, issues with the, the power sector operations. Uh, and battery storage costs are still not there, despite recent hype, to, to be able to overcome that. Uh, and so you have a situation where increasingly in the future you'll have solar and, and other renewables taking up a larger share of, of total power production. You'll still need gas-fired units in order to back that up and firm it for when the, the wind or, or the sun is not available. But the, the volume of gas required to do that will be less and it'll be far more volatile, which is a challenge for the upstream, which would much prefer to just have a steady stream of gas flowing into the market and off their hands. So managing that uh, disconnect, if you will, or that challenge, I think will be increasingly important as well, especially for those countries that are, are smaller and have less of a domestic economy to absorb the gas uh, than a country state like Brazil.
Let me wrap it up there and, and head to questions. Yeah, I think we could ask mm -hmm. questions. Thank you. Yeah. That was some very interesting um, points that you made. Well, I think we have about half an hour for questions, so maybe I'll take a few um, together, and then I'll give each of you a chance to respond. Um, OK, do we have any questions? I have a few myself. But over here. Um, and please uh, introduce yourself before asking your question. Hi, I'm Haiku Garats of uh, Argus Media. Uh, wanted to ask you a question about the recent change in uh, or recent interpretation of the first refusal rules for developing uh, the pre-sold. Uh, I understand that it still gives Petrobras an opportunity to uh, participate in investment, uh, even though if it might be awarded to another company. I wondered uh, if Mr. Adonai can explain the reasoning maybe behind that, and uh, do you think it's positive for the industry uh, overall? Um, are there any other questions? Um, let me just add to myself. One question is I wanted to um, ask if you had a response to this issue of the environmental regulations, this being now one of the few um, issues that the, the industry still has. Um, and my other question is, um, going back to a couple of the speakers mentioned other sectors. We're not just talking about upstream gas, downstream logistics. So um, if Petrobras is divesting from these, from these areas, what do, you, what do you think will happen to the industry? This could be for, for any of you. Um, who are the new potential players that are coming in when you know, you're essentially getting rid of a monopoly? You know, how will that sector develop? Is it attractive? Um, or is it going to be a challenge? Will it be more domestic or international companies? So would you like to start, Garcia? OK, I will take that one on the preferential right. You know that the, the law that uh, approved the entrance of new operators in the pre-south was uh, inclu included a, a provision that Petrobras had the right to decide if they want to opt for one or more of the blocks in offer. So recently, this week, the government announced a decree in which this, this preferential right, which is established in the law, is regulated. And the regulation says that Petrobras has the right to say in which areas they want to, to participate, but also they have the right to withdraw if the price paid during the, the auction is too, is too high for their, in their opinion. And I think that's, that's positive in terms of in anticipation, showing to the market what are the rules. Several delays in, in licensing companies acquired a block in a, in a, in a bidding round and then waiting years to get the, the license. In our point of view, it is not reasonable. Either we offer the blocks with the pre-license or we don't, but these delays are not, uh, are not welcome. So there are two, two initiatives in underway to, to deal with this question. First one is a new environmental bill related to environmental licensing, which is under discussion. And the idea is to establish some schedules, firm schedules for, for the environmental agencies to act. And this is under discussion uh, with the parliament. And there is another initiative which is also very important. Is, uh, as far as I remember, is an initiative of Senador Anastasia from Minas Gerais, which is a law that protects the actions of these public, public servants when they operate in good faith. Nowadays in Brazil, uh, public servants, they can be responsible for decisions that they do uh, while taking care of some of those issues like environmental license. And this, this bill, uh, protects the the acts of these public servants in good faith. So it's very positive to to give more authority for the public servants in, involved in the licensing process. Uh, 
then I, I pass the other question to to George. Um, about yeah the other sectors and who will be involved and how that will work. Okay. On the first question. Okay, I can do that. Uh, first on that on, on that uh, on that on that uh, situation of the investments on the downstream. Huh? This is a, an area that really does make sense for a, for a company, for a country the size of Brazil, with the five or the fifth or the sixth largest market in the world, to have one company. Huh? Uh, we do this. Uh, we do the downstream sector under their responsibility. So that's like in gas. The gas uh, opening is started with Petrobras' decision to start to divest, and as a result, they they, they attract uh, Mitsui, Brookfield, so the companies that have different profiles. Uh, private equity, and I'd like to emphasize one point that that's made that Brazil is doing now, and the, the agencies very much uh, to try to open that, that uh, attract investors that from come from the more diverse as possible. Uh, people that are from the let's say the business, people from 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 the, the private sector, the, the the private equity. So th these are things that is a good move to 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 open for as much as possible profiles of different investments investors to come to Brazil because the size of the opportunity is huge. So this is one thing. On, on, the, on, the, on the downstream, the key issue is pricing. Huh? How can you get into a sector if you are, uh, let's say, concerned that the, the price will be controlled by the government? This has been the, the, what happened the last two years. Huh? This is not what's going to, what is happening anymore. So prices now is fluctuating according to international parity. And this is key, is key to attract investors in the downstream. Of course, people demand, OK, what happens when Pedro Parente goes or the next election, do we have a different presidential? So I think for, for that, I think the most important is, to, for, is the, the, how much uh, Petrobras will be able to divest on their assets. If you have, let's say, a more, a more diversified market, no? Then you have the guarantee that Petrobras, instead of being, let's say, the price maker, is be the price taker. So be less, less influenced by government policies no? or, or government interventions or uh, these type of things. So the pricing will be key, and the, 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 the divestment program of Petrobras will be the two main act. And then we're going to see which kind of companies want to come to Brazil. You, you could be producers of, uh, of oil that want to integrate their their, their activity. It could be, let's say, niche players that are focused on the, on, on midstream or on the on, on, on the refinery from the, the the west or from Asia. So there are really a, a large amount of uh, people that could be potentially interested in Brazil due to the size of the market, due to the potential of growth. So I, I'm quite. Uh, uh, and from what we, we we hear in IBP, lots of people coming to understand more how Brazil is. Is going so. I think it will be a process. It will be take some time. It's not going to be like that. It's going to to, to happen over the years. On, on on your question on the on the preferential rights that has been uh, uh, announced today, we in IBP uh, we don't think this uh, to have uh, any kind of preferential rights is good for the open competition. See, so it creates some uncertainty. It creates some uh, some concern on investments. Having said that, I'd like to say to you that uh, there are many of these decisions that have been taken recently. For example, local content. Huh? What has been approved is not exactly, is not what we have proposed. We are in favor of a, a, a local content policy that's not based on fines, it's based on incentives, is uh, more focused on some areas that Brazil has competitive advantage. So what the government decided was, it's not what we have proposed in IBP, it has decided to reduce the the, the, the level of fines, reduce the level of uh, commitments. So what we are seeing, really, is uh, progress. Progress that uh, on the right direction, right? Uh, doing what is possible, uh, what is possible that we, we, we can do. And, but overall, I think we can feel that the government has a kind of strategic and political uh, direction uh, towards a more open and more competitive and a more transparent business environment in Brazil, and that's good. But we are going to move in, in, uh, in a pace that will depend very much on the, on the, 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 on the circumstance. So that, that, that's how we are, we are moving. We are, we are advancing. We are adv advancing, not, uh, and we don't, in IBP, don't believe that we are the owners of the truth. You know, there are a lot of other interests, other people that 
think differently. And it's up to the government, of course, to, to make decisions. And we respect and we acknowledge that we are moving in the right direction. I would like to add something to the downstream and again, natural gas uh, environment in, in, in Brazil as well. The movement in the natural gas uh, opening is al has already initi been initiated because Petrobras already sold some assets and it's doing business with other assets. But we see also a uh, very important window of opportunity because some of the contracts, supply contracts for the local distribution companies, they, they, they end by 2019, and then it, it may bring a chance for new suppliers to, 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 to have a presence in addition to, to Petrobras. So it's not only Petrobras' uh, divestment program, but also the circumstance of the timing of the country, especially also the Bolivian contract expires in, in 2019. In the downstream sector, is, uh, this movement is, is in the very beginning, but we have seen a very important uh, initiative regarding the price, pricing policy. Now Petrobras is adopting uh, international prices. This adoption of the international price has changed the supply in Brazil. Last year, 85% of all, all diesel oil imported into Brazil was imported for third parties, private companies, not by Petrobras, which import only 15% of the, the diesel imported into the country. So the more we rely on different supplies, the more competitive will be our, our market and the more effective will be our pricing policy. When, you, when you, we make a projection, we, depending on how fast the economy will recover, we can estimate that the country may be importing 500, 600, 700, even 1 million barrels of uh, oil derivatives by the end of the next decade. We do not have... Uh, refining projects in the pipeline. The production of uh, crude will increase, the exports will increase. So there is a uh, financial incentive for companies to eventually invest in, in, in refining projects in Brazil. I would say initially in expansions, but uh, in the future maybe new refining uh, projects not especially because the refining project is something very attractive, but because the refining project be, may be very attractive in Brazil because of the circumstance. We are not in the main international commerce routes. We pay very expensive transportation costs to export crude and to import oil derivatives, and this put an incentive for investment. And I really believe that when we, the market has confidence that the price policies there to stay, this difference will be noted and then we will start talking about new projects. Okay, do you have any, um, okay, well, are there any other questions? Um, yeah. An easy one, please. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, it might be in left field. Um, I'm Rebecca Givens, I'm from Clearview Energy Partners. Um, I have a quick question about how you see biofuels potentially playing into this um, energy transition. Good for me. I, I do have a view. <laughs> Brazil is a very important producer of biofuels. Ethanol, biodiesel. We have uh, idle capacity now. And the government is uh, discussing the new biofuels policy uh, in a program called Canova Bio. And we estimate that part of the increase in the consumption of the, the oil derivatives in Brazil will be met by biofuels, especially because uh, the Brazil commitment to COP21 and all the reduction in emissions. So I think there is a bright future for the increase in biofuels production in Brazil, and industry has been very hit by the crisis lately, and I hope the sector will 
come back to the good old days. They have the chance. May I just uh, add a few things because that's that's an, uh, another area that uh, Brazil is really really competitive. Né? As you know, biofuels in Brazil is one of the most competitive countries. We can produce a large amount with, uh, let's say, the minimum, let's say, environmental impact. We don't need to go into forests. We have uh, areas that that can do that. It's not only biofuels. We have also the, in, in this renewable uh, space. Brazil today is one of the most competitive for wind and solar. Né? The amount of uh, the, the efficiency of this, uh, the, the production of wind and solar in Brazil is in some areas of Brazil, in the northeast in particular, second to none. So Brazil is, I think, a very large uh, energy producer in the, in, the, in the broad sense, biofuel, solar, wind, and oil and gas, of course. With the, I think the most uh, clean energy matrix in, in, in the in between the, in, among the large countries. I also have a question about the, the politics. Um, so, are you concerned that um, you know it's it's really uncertain what who the next president will be, what their you know energy policy will be? Um, are you concerned that they'll completely reverse all of the things that that the government's been doing recently? Is there a way to maybe to ensure or at least you know protect against that happening? Um, you know, are there is there a way to ensure some sort of continuity? Um, over that time, and I also want to ask Jed, you know, if you, it's interesting that um, there's a, a, the same question is being asked in Mexico by everyone. So, I mean, do you think that there, you know, is something that Brazil can do um, to ensure some sort of continuity? Is there something, you know, you see from the Mexican case in terms of their response, you know, with institutions, et cetera? So I'll let can each, I, yeah. Can I start with uh, with uh, what happened to this this event, uh, the, the next election? That's uh, something. Is going to be reversed. What is with the progress that we have been having? Well, I'm, I'm not a political analyst, as you know. I'm a, I'm a humble oil man, but uh, just to, my, my view is that uh, no, we, we are not going to come back, right? And I explain why. So any government that, of course, we can have a Brazil democracy, we can go to one way or, or another. Any government that, let's say, minimally pragmatic, we realize that the model that really depends on on state investment or state protagonism is no longer possible. No? The, the ability of Petrobras to invest has been capped by their financial situation, no? which is well, well below of, the, of Brazil's capacity of investment. So Brazil could attract easily something in the order of 50, 60 billion dollars only on, on, on upstream, no? and is investing less than 20 nowadays. If you look, so 50 to 60 billion dollars represents more or less 10% of the, the total global, and Brazil could attract at least that. A year. A year, a year, all right? So the, the, the question is that Brazil, is, as you know, is, is going through get, getting out of a very, very uh, dreadful economic price. We, need, we have 30 million people unemployed, so if you want, and, uh, and the oil and gas is one area that doesn't depend on the recovery of the Brazilian economy. It doesn't depend on that, as does infrastructure, the real estate sector. It depends on the commodity price and the global competitiveness. So that's one area that where, where Brazil can start to recover or be a very important, uh, let's say, uh, driver for economic uh, recovery is oil and gas. So to give up on that potential, uh, since the Petrobras is limited, not to use, let's say, the private investment capacity that is, is there, né? the capital is available for brute projects, and, and Brazil is a good brand. This does make sense. Perhaps, or most or less certainly, this would be a big issue during the election process. There will be a big dialogue debate, etc. But once, who else wins? I think that uh, to reverse the, the policies that have been make, made Brazil more attractive to private investments, I don't believe this is going to happen. What, what can, can change, I think maybe it's the pace of the, of the progress. If you have a more liberal, then we're going to, to have a, a faster pace of opening, of diversification, privatizations. And if you have a more, let's say, left-wing type of uh, candidate, this is going to be slower. But the, the general trend, I think, will be, will, will be maintained. Just one comment. I would like to say that we will try to prove with results that it would be uh, the wrong move to change direction. So to build on that, just so quick observations of, of what we've seen in Mexico and what that may mean for Brazil. I mean, certainly there is concern in Mexico that the, the leading candidate now is, is 
uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who you know in the past has come out very strongly against uh, the energy reform, against private sector investment um, in the energy sector. The the strategy that the the Mexican government has taken is to first make the reforms as deep as possible, starting with the constitution. So changing it is uh, difficult and time consuming. Uh, and then to move as fast as possible in order to get as much accomplished as they can before the end of the sexenio. And theoretically, to show very clear benefits to the broader public from the, the reform before the elections, so they can then build on that success. I think the, the reform was oversold early on. Um, and in, and it, I think it needed to be in order to build up the momentum for the political change. But I think there had to be a transition from, from cheerleader to make the, the politics happen, to pragmatic, to minimize um, expectations, to at least to, to change expectations to something more realistic. And I think that needed to happen sooner than it did in Mexico. So they, they run a risk now of, of a, a population that expects more than the reform can deliver. Um, and at the same time, they've been moving so fast that there are, you know, there have been hiccups along the way that could have been avoided if they moved more slowly. But at the same time, there's a very clear political imperative to move as fast as possible. So, so within that construct, I think in Brazil, the, the key question is, do, are, do contracts remain um, in place? Is the sanctity of contracts still respected post-election? Uh, my belief is yes, yeah, certainly. I haven't seen anything um, of the people that are, that are running that would suggest uh, an extreme swing um, that would try and break previous contracts. So as was noted, the pace going forward could change or the direction could change, but I think what's been accomplished to date uh, will likely remain. One comment on that. We have a tradition, tradition in Brazil of respecting contracts. We have never, ever broken any, any contract. And even when we change the, the law for the pre salt establishing the production sharing contracts, all old concession contracts were respected. And I would add that, would like to add that the increase in the oil production that we are facing now in Brazil from the pre salt are originating these old concession contracts licensing in the old model for the pre-sale. So this is not uh, a, a concern. The change in the contracts in Brazil is not in, uh, in the table. We are discussing t tendency, political tendency who, which could ap be applied to future developments. But we have never in Brazil faced any change in <laughs> past contracts. And what is public opinion about you know, the, the change in the legislation? Is it generally supported? Are people not paying much attention? Are they expecting, is the fact that it, or gasoline prices are going to be aligned with international prices? Again, in Mexico, that was, there was a lot of um, opposition. You know, when prices went up, it, it led people to also oppose the reform overall. So what's public opinion in Brazil? <laughs> well, you know that uh, uh, on, the, on, on the pricing policy, now, this is news. Uh, in the past, in Brazil, every time Petrobras changed the oil price, that, but there was big news in Jornal Nacional, which is the main broadcast in Brazil. So this has changed. Petrobras is more or less pushing up and down the price every every month. So it's, it's coming to the to, to, to less pages of the, the newspapers nowadays. When there, there is so we are, it's a change of culture. And when you change, people react initially as something new. They are not very very, very comfortable, but they are accepting, and that's what we need. Yeah? On the, on the opening of the oil and gas, this is a kind of emotional, ideological issue. Right? So this is something that uh, uh, we are going to have perhaps not a very, a very uh, uh, rational debate. It's much more political. And, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I think the debate, uh, the, the, the political and emotional debate is one thing. The, 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 the outcome of this debate is another. And I think that, as I said, wh whatever area that or, or, or part that wins, I think they are going to have to go in this way, or we are going to give up on the, all, all these jobs, all the revenues, all these investments that we, as that to show that can be really, really open if we have, uh, if Brazil restores its competitiveness, its lost competitiveness to attract investments. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question over here. Thank you. My name is Liliana Diaz, and I, um, I am from John Hopkins' size slash BRG. Uh, thank you for your presentations. 
I have two questions. Um, one is about the sustainability of the changes, the recent changes. Um, this you had a slide that showed the um, different episodes in which Brazil has tried to open the oil and gas sector. And each of those episodes has been preceded by crisis. So I think about these, and perhaps I have two interpretations, and I would like your opinion on both of them, which one is the most correct. First is it's a boomerang effect. Crisis comes, change happens. But once you recover, you go back to this state-centered tradition and reverse the change. The second one is this is a process. This is refining, uh, bringing Brazil to being um, a competitive player in the marketplace um, oriented by a market strategy. The second question is about local content. Nobody has spoken much about local content and the huge change. And it's huge because local content has been an impediment for monetizing those reserves. And it is, um, I understand, the tool that the Brazilian government has used to link oil and gas extraction to economic development. And now it's been taken out of the table. When you're back on track, you're enjoying having lots of investment, are you going to have a reversal? Because the logic has always been, we're going to use the oil and gas resources to develop this country, and you really need to develop um, our oil service industry and um, get a lot of impulse from this uh, extractive activity. And I'm sorry, my questions are really heavy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we have about two minutes left. So okay, I, I will start by trying to be quick in respect of time. Well, I think it's a process. Uh, it's a tra tradition in, in Latin America that pendulum swings from one side to the other. But Brazil is a slow mover. Always the moves are smaller in, 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 in Brazil. We don't go too much to one side or to the other. And I think we are moving in the right direction in a process. We're opening up the economy since the, the, the 60s. And this is, a, this is a long process that we believe is coming to a better way. And according to local content, you mentioned local content. We, we did not extinguish local content in Brazil. We have perfection, perfection at the, the local content requirements. And there is a series of initiatives in order to, to help the local suppliers to be much more competitive. No, I, I agree with you. Yeah, uh, we, we, that's what said. Latin America moves in waves. Nah? We have the military to take to shift waves, the liberal waves, the populist waves that are finishing now. Né? Normally, Argentina is the, the, the trendsetter, and Brazil the slower mover. But uh, we, we are moving that direction. But on, on the change, uh, basically, the price of the commodity, huh? when you have a very high price of oil price, people, co countries like, uh, in, country, in areas like Latin America, Jeb knows that well, moves to more states' protagonism. And when oil price goes down, the money ends, and then you have to rely on more private investment. So, so that's a risk, yes, if you have another cycle, another $100 oil price. No, not many people believe that. But if we stay, as I said, in this low oil price that uh, requires that you have a very discipline of capital, you have to reduce cost, this other model is not possible. Basically, that's the, the, the question. But if you come back to that, to that level, then uh, things could uh, move again. And on local content, that's the, the, the key point. What drives local content is not a reserve a protection of markets, it's investments. Né? The, the way local content has been established in Brazil was restricting investments. And as a result, restricting local content development. Né? That's what we have showed. We have lots of projects that cannot be developed because they are exposed to fines that makes them uneconomical. So this uh, perfectioning that the government has done will really open investments and will bring together local content. Not everything. There are some areas that Brazil cannot uh, compete with others, but on, on other areas we can. You know, to see oh, Exxon was uh, uh, talking about this LISA project in the Goiânia, and that all the subsea components, subsea uh, flux, flex flux, flux, flux lines and uh, uh, Christmas trees, bought in Brazil. 
made in Brazil. So that, that, that's what we need. We need to insert a local content that's smart, that they insert Brazil in the global uh, chains, you know, instead of trying to make, for example, holes that we cannot make uh, less than 300% more than doing in China. Or, so it does make sense to do this in Brazil. So that's the perfection that we are moving. Local content is very important. The operators, the investors, really love local content. You know why oh, the, the shale oil is so competitive in, in, the, in the US? Because they're very, very large and very effective local suppliers. This is not, you cannot have this in Argentina for the vaca muerta so that the price is high. So that's the dream of a, any operator is to have a, a very, strong base of local suppliers to supply. So we support that. What we don't support is local content that, that re restricts investments. This is not smart uh, local content policy. And that's what we, we are moving from. Jed, do you want to make any final comments? <laughs> OK, well, we're out of time. So, out of, out of time. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. This was extremely informative and interesting. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure